Good afternoon, everybody. I'm <clears throat> Sally Whipple, and I am the Executive Director of Connecticut's Old State House, and I am so happy to welcome you to our building and our historic courtroom today. Um, this is one of uh, um, our monthly series, Conversations at Noon, which we've been doing since 2009. Um, and since 2009, we've used this lunchtime spot to explore historical topics and current issues that have affected and activated Connecticut people throughout history and into today. Since this is 2018, we're going to spend a few months this year looking at Connecticut's Constitution of 1818 and how its story has reverberated through time. The first um, talk in that series will be on February 22nd at noon. It will be free and it's sponsored um, by the Connecticut Humanities Council and Connecticut Explored Magazine. We're really looking forward to having that conversation about the Constitution. Today, however, we are extremely honored to partner with the Connecticut Foundation for Open Government for a discussion of the First Amendment. This is a slightly different kind of conversation at noon, and we hope to build on it by finding new ways to explore and understand the frameworks that guide our civic lives. What we've been finding in the last few years is that people are very hungry for this kind of information and very eager to discuss this kind of information. So we find this a really wonderful program to be able to present today. CFOG originally created this program for high school students, but it is clearly a conversation that everyone can benefit from. This afternoon, we have two wonderful guests, author and veteran journalist Dennis Horgan and eminent First Amendment lawyer Dan Clough, both CFOG board members, will discuss the importance of the First Amendment and freedom of information in today's world. They also really appreciate the way I'm introducing them. Yeah, so I like that. My eminent. mother does. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's very <laughs> eminent, very eminent. Uh, <laughs> These two engaging speakers will share their long experiences from the twin perspectives of law and journalism. Dennis Horgan is a veteran journalist and author who has worked at newspapers in Boston, Bangkok, and Washington, and for 25 years as a columnist and editor at the Hartford Current. He's written several books of fiction, nonfiction, and memoir that reflect his career in newspapers and public life. He is the recipient of the Connecticut Council on Freedom of Information Stephen A. Collins Award for his contributions <clears throat> to the cause of open government and a free and vigorous press. Dan Clow is one of New England's leading appellate and First Amendment lawyers. I always have trouble with appellate, and I have to say it like five times now. A graduate of Boston University School of Law and a former law clerk to Chief Justice Ellen Ash Peters of the <clears throat> Connecticut Supreme Court. Dan has successfully represented private and public sector clients in, in, in his appeals in the Connecticut Supreme and Appellate Courts, the United States Courts of Appeal for the First and Second Circuits, and the United States Supreme Court. He is the president of the Connecticut Council on Freedom of Information and a past president of CFOG. He is a frequent writer, commentator, and lecturer on appellate, First Amendment, and over, open government issues. Dan is also the author of the legal blog, Appealingly Brief, and has been an adjunct professor at UConn School of Law since 2003, where he teaches privacy and First Amendment law. He is also supervising attorney at the Yale Law School of Media and Freedom and Information Access Clinic. We are very happy to have both of these people here. I have to say, when we were first thinking of this, I went to a meeting um, with these two gentlemen and Mitch Perlman, um, also of CFOG, and the head of the program committee, I believe, or this program. And, um, we fell into a conversation that was just so fascinating. We thought this is something that the public really needs to be involved with. So um, I welcome both Dan and Dennis to the Old State House, and I will let you conduct the program. Thank you, Sally. Well, thank you, yeah. And I guess <clears throat> I get to start, because uh, I'm not so eminent as, uh, <laughs> as Brother Dan, who is truly eminent and, and, and uh, wise and, and clever and, and also makes wonderful music. He sings and, and things like that. So if you need to be having a wedding or anything, you can <laughs> look him up, right. look him up un, <clears throat> under eminent. But um, yes, I'm Dennis Horgan, and um, I, uh, I'm going to start this. What we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit, very briefly, about kind of the history of First Amendment, where it came from, and, uh, and how it's developed in, in, in the United States, almost alone. And then really kind of end this thing, we hope, if we get there, uh, with uh, some looks at where it is today and what some of the really, really special and uh, almost frightening challenges that are going on uh, in 
First Amendment issues as well as a lot of other things. But we're going into the First Amendment. Now, you all know the First Amendment. Everybody knows the First Amendment. Actually, you probably don't. Uh, what we've found, one of the reasons we go around the schools and, uh, and try to do programs like this is that people know there is a First Amendment, but they kind of, you know, yeah, there's a First Amendment. Yeah, there's a, there's a um, you know, Mount Rushmore. There's, uh, there are these things. But how we got there and how we got to this very simple document, which is so simple I wrote it out so I wouldn't forget it, uh, even though I've lived under its protection uh, professionally for nearly 50 years. Uh, Quite simply, it says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or of the right of the people peacefully, peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. I don't know how many words there are, and I, to, I can't count that far, but there aren't many, but there's so much value packed into that that it's, uh, it's a kind of an astonishing thing. I've been in newspapers for, well, 45 years, uh, getting paid for it, and, and longer since when I know that I don't get paid for it, uh, as I write on my own. Uh, and I've worked in big city papers in Boston and Washington. I've worked in little tiny papers in Asia, and uh, most happily uh, for a long time in a medium-sized but excellent newspaper here in Hartford, Connecticut, called The Current. And I, I don't think we ever, in any newsroom that I've ever been in, where they sat around and said, oh, man, thank God for the First Amendment. You know, that, that uh, Jimmy Madison, let's set up an Elijah Sheffer. I mean, he, he's, just the, he's just the Boston. He, he, we don't, people don't talk like that. In the movies, they talk like that. Newsrooms, newsrooms, we don't talk like that. But we always knew. Steven Spielberg movies. Steven Spielberg, and all, or all of them. They, with all these people talk like movie actors. Uh, and that's good. It's, I'm glad they're doing it. Uh, but the... Uh, even if we didn't, you know, kind of get all reverential and goosebumpy all the time over the thing, we knew in varying degrees, and we know in varying degrees because this is not a past tense uh, thing at all, that the public's right to, uh, to speak under the speech part of that, in the same clause, they put together, but separate, in the same clause, speech and press, which is, I think, kind of significant, because they could have just said speech, and that would have covered us, but they particularly said they brought in the press, and that we have this right, and it was enshrined by a bunch of guys who, by any, any historical measure, could be expected to have done the exact opposite. The path of revolutions is clear. Uh, ours, the French, the Russians, the Chinese, uh, Pick them. There are hundreds of them going on all the time. And what generally happens, what always happens, with uh, one kind of major exception, is that as soon as the, the revolutionaries get in power under the flags of freedom and, and um, the rights of the people and, and all of this, is they take away those freedoms and the rights of the people. This happened in France in the reign of terror. It happened in Russia for the, in the Soviet Union for over 70 years. It happened uh, just about everywhere. Whenever there's a revolution, the first thing they do close the newspapers, take over the TV stations, shut them down, play martial music, and then work them for propaganda. And they say, well, we're going to give this back to you. We're going to give these rights back to you any minute now. Any minute we're going to give them back to you. And they don't. And yet this, this gang down in, in Philadelphia and uh, representing places where are coming out of rooms like this, almost alone, maybe, maybe, maybe even alone, I can say that, did the opposite. They said, okay, we will give you, we will enshrine these rights in our principal document, and we mean it. When they got together to do the Constitutional Convention, their main principal goal in that game was to establish a federal, a federal system of government. That's all they wanted. That was the, the make or break thing. That uh, Washington and those other guys who went in there said, if we don't get that, we're walking out, essentially. Uh, they had, had the Articles of the Confederacy had been established during the war, didn't work very well during the revolution, and certainly did not work thereafter. The smart guys knew it, some people didn't like it. So they met in Philadelphia for a long, hot summer and uh, produced this new form of government, such as not been seen before, and worked up a constitution, which is really an operating manual for this new government. They did not go down there to set a uh, 
a great uh, angel holding the corners of the documents uh, thing. This was a bunch of very practical people who went down to say, look, our government doesn't work. You like it over there, Rhode Island, the present one. You don't like it over here, Virginia. Okay, we'll, we'll work this deal out. It was a very practical group. And it's uh, kind of funny, Dan and I have talked about this, that the, the um, in, in our view anyway, the uh, strict construction types, the Scalia's of the world, um, say, no, no that, this is scripture. This is a God-given document. You can't change a word of it. Uh, I, I, I'm guessing that they would have been pretty surprised to hear that because they were not strict constructionists. They were revolutionaries. They had just overthrown uh, the control of one of the great empires of the earth on their lives. They, they were changing everything. And to the point, their constitution, our constitution, was a product of compromise. Okay, we'll give you this, we'll give you the little states, we'll give you that, big states, we'll give you that. And uh, to get you aboard, and we won't talk about slavery because we'll lose the whole game, it'll be all over, uh, uh, because there were people who, uh, who felt that, and, and it was a very practical thing. So pack it up, here we go. All right, thank you very much, shake hands, see you, uh, see you next time. Well, people made objection to this, and they had to sell it. And one of the objections was that yeah, it's okay to produce a constitution that is a mechanical document for the operating of the government, but it doesn't speak to the rights that we had this revolution for in the first place, five years earlier, uh, only, that, um, actually four. Um, that was the point of the whole game, and you don't have to say, okay, you're right, okay, well, to get your vote, and maybe because we also believe it, I don't know, uh, they keep, uh, Madison came up with the 10 pieces of the Bill of Rights, and the very first one, of course, was the one, First Amendment, which we're here to talk about. And this, this is an amazing gift to people. This is, to the fact that they did it already is amazing because that's not what revolutions do. Uh, revolutions are people taking the power away from other people who have the power. And yet these guys did it. And it came out of a context of the Enlightenment, which was about 100 years old at that time and only lasted for another 15 years or so, where a bunch of French scholars and geniuses like Voltaire or, or Burke and guys from England, all were speaking to the idea of change, of, in, of an enlightened form of, of life that the great institutions of government and the church would not have the power that they have. Now, none of those people actually did it. France didn't do it, England didn't do it, but we did. Our guys over here, maybe because we were distant for whatever reason, we produced this majestic document of the Bill of Rights, which goes very well with this um, constitution, which has lasted for these hundreds of years. So the freedom of the press part, uh, now just quickly, the, the press in those days was not the post in the movie or the Hartford Current up the street with great big presses and, and hundreds of employees. It was tended to be uh, small, um, Outfits like the Hartford Current at that time, the Hartford Current, a few papers, maybe the only one around, it is the only one around that was still around at that point. Uh, was, well, it was done in somebody's shop, and they you know, essentially took articles from other papers and they recircled them around and sent them out through the mail, and people got to read them, the people who could read. And, but the larger piece of the press of that moment were the pamphleteers. Thomas Paine's and the guys like that who were writing up uh, actual philosophical treatises on, on government, on life, on all these different things. And the, this is the press that they were talking about protecting. And what a gift that has been to us for all these years, where the government is saying, the government shall not be allowed, shall make no laws. The government shall make no laws. Congress will make, just to say the government so make no laws that will we'll take that away from you. Now, we're not going to help you do it. We're not going to you know, spare you from any punishment after you do it. But we're not going to stop you from doing it. And so we have a First Amendment. And we have a press that has, at that point, was small and vibrant and, and ferocious. Anybody who thinks that the, the uh, media today is so coarse and that it's, so, so, it's just terrible. <laughs> I mean, go back and read. I mean, it's fun to read. I mean, these people, it's like a North Korean propaganda machine. This, he isn't just an uh, eminent guy. He is the greatest man in history of the earth. But this guy over here, he is a bum from hell and is, uh, may all his children rotten. And it was very vibrant and, and, 
and uh, very partisan and very, very aggressive and very much a pain in the neck for the uh, government. And that's always been the way government has always come against the, um, its critics and uh, there was a long history of people uh, in authority not much liking the people who would be criticizing them. And yet the government established itself with, a, with its basic document to allow people to do that very thing. And this goes against even an American tradition is a thing I'm fond of quoting, and this may be my last quote. Uh, this is pre-revolutionary, but it comes from a fellow you probably all know if you come to places like this much, uh, a great uh, powerful figure in Massachusetts, but maybe all uh, um, colonial religion, Cotton Mather. Uh, the Mather family up there were a bunch of Bible thumpers and fire and brimstone types. Old Cotton, he writes, or he spoke, or he tweeted, he says, we find a notorious scandalous paper called The Current, full freighted with nonsense, unmanliness, profaneness, immorality, arrogance, calumnies, lies, contradictions, and whatnot, all tending to quarrels and divisions, and to debauch and corrupt the minds and manners of New England. Wow, what a, that's, that's why I came to The Current. I said, this is, it's going to be my paper. Turns out it wasn't the same current. He wasn't talking about the Hartford current. He's talking Boston current. But, uh, but the point, it, it, there was no greater authority in those days than the church. And, uh, and there was no greater authority in the church than, than the Mathers. And, and there he was, raging away and tweeting away about the, uh, about the, the fake news and, and, and debauching. It's just always, we've always had this. And we have it right now. And maybe we go to hell in Cotton's view, but we don't go to prison. And we owe that to the First Amendment. Now, it wasn't a smooth thing always, because the government it wasn't always, OK, let's, we've done that First Amendment business. Now let's get on to working on uh, this electricity that old Franklin's always talking about. But, uh, so it didn't go quite as smoothly as we'd liked it to have, but it did go. And Dan can take it from there. From those uh, auspicious beginnings, the First Amendment made a pretty big thump for the first 150 years. What if I said this to you? President Trump and his administration is the single most corrupt administration in the history of this country. On a daily basis, the president violates various aspects of the Constitution. He breaks the law. He has more conflicts of interests than one could ever imagine. He is corrupt. He needs to be removed from government. He should be impeached. He should be indicted. 150 years ago, well, well, 200 and some odd years ago, before the First Amendment, <clears throat> what I just spoke was called seditious libel. I had the audacity to criticize my government, to call for the removal of the equivalent of its king, and I could be put in prison for doing that. That would be unimaginable today, that this kind of criticism uh, could lead to a prison <clears throat> sentence or a very, very hefty fine. But prior to the adoption of the First Amendment, that's what could happen. And one of the most important things that the founders wanted to do when they, uh, when they uh, presented the Bill of Rights at the ratifying conventions, as Dennis says, to induce people to accept this new blueprint for a federal government, was basically say, uh, Congress cannot pass laws to punish you for having the audacity to criticize the government. Because one of the basic rights of all humans is the right to criticize their rulers, to seek changes in the, the structure of their governments and to challenge their rulers. Now, remarkably, only a decade, if that, after the First Amendment was passed, then President Thomas, uh, excuse me, uh, John Adams, our second president, passes something called the Alien and Sedition Acts, which does what? It criminalizes people who have the audacity to criticize the federal government and John Adams. And there were a number of prosecutions under that act. Uh, and it's remarkable, you have to ask yourself, how could this first Congress, first or second Congress, which was so intimately familiar with the arguments that were made in favor of adoption of the First Amendment, pass a law 
that seems to so clearly violate the lang plain language of the First Amendment. That, those cases never made their way up to the United States Supreme Court, though. And then once Thomas Jefferson was elected in 1800, um, the, the new Congress rep uh, quickly repealed those Alien and Sedition Acts. And then for 119 years, there was utter silence from the Supreme Court on the meaning of the First Amendment. If you bring yourself roughly 119 years forward from 1800, you find yourself uh, at the end of the First World War. And once again, Congress, uh, in the midst of that war, passed something called an Espionage Act of 1917, and it passed the Sedition Act of 1918. And these acts, again, made it a criminal, criminal conduct to uh, do anything that undermined people's faith in their government that could pot possibly have the effect of undermining the war effort uh, and American support for the war effort. So if somebody issued a pamphlet that, set, that compared conscription, you know, the draft, to slavery, that person was convicted of violating, violating the Espionage Act or the Sedition Act because the natural tendency of making that statement was to cause people to, uh, to not enlist and therefore to undermine the war effort, all right? Eugene Debs, who ran for president, how many times did he run Four for president? Five, yeah. right. uh, uh, made a statement that criticized uh, the government and its involvement in World War I. And this was considered to be a violation of the Espionage Act. So finally, these prosecutions, these criminal convictions, worked their way up to the United States Supreme Court. And what did it do? Did it protect their uh, right of these individuals to say things that were critical of their government? No, it caved. Ah, this is an embarrassing, embarrassing period in the history of the Supreme Court. It upheld these convictions, and it basically said the First Amendment does not forbid the government from passing laws that punish people for saying things that have a natural tendency to cause substantive evils that Congress can prevent. So if Congress has the right to declare war, and it does, and if it does declare war on, on Germany and uh, the Axis in World War I, and if it has a draft, and if it has munitions factories to build munitions, and somebody says something that has the tendency to undermine the draft, or, or somebody says, we shouldn't be spending money on munitions, we should be spending it on, on making uh, you know, dairy prices lower because people are not having access to food. Right? The US Supreme Court said that those, uh, constitute, those uh, prosecutions did not violate the Constitution. And then in a very famous decision in 1919, Justice Holmes, who all through the war had supported those decisions, flips. And he writes one of the greatest dissents in the history of the Supreme Court in a case called Abrams versus the United States. Right? And it's a case, again, involving the publication of a pamphlet um, by uh, some people that were critical of the war effort they were convicted, the Supreme Court upheld the conviction, but, uh, but Oliver, excuse me, Justice Holmes said, we cannot convict people for their speech, even when it's critical of the government, unless there is a quote, and you're gonna love this phrase because it became the title of a movie starting, starring Harrison Ford, right? <laughs> Anybody know what it is? Clear and present danger, right? Unless the speech poses a clear and present danger. All right. But even then, his language, that test was in a dissent. And then mm -hmm. after World War I, we had the Red Scare. All right? And there were acts passed both at the federal level and the state level um, that, uh, that made it a crime to advocate for the overthrow of your government. 
So if you were an American and you believed in the communist revolution in Russia or socialism and you argued for change um, and maybe even said, you know, we should take up arms against our government, that language you could be prosecuted for. Even if you didn't do it, nothing happened, right? You're just talking about the, the need to change our government because you're critical of it. Finally, finally, in the 1950s, the court begins to appreciate the wisdom of Justice Holmes' dissent in the Abrams case. And his dissent becomes the law. So in the midst of the new Red Scare in the 1950s, late 40s and 50s, and McCarthyism and witch hunts looking for uh, communist spies who have infiltrated our government, finally the Supreme Court so, shows some backbone. And it, and it adopts the clear and present danger test as the law of the land. So if you are a person who is simply criticizing the government, if you are a person who is talking about the value of Marxism or Leninism, or is advocating um, violent over, even violent overthrow of your government, but is not taking specific steps towards that end, is not urging people immediately to run down to the local gun store and buy guns, okay? absent that immediate threat, immediate incitement of violence, that speech is protected. So finally, my point is this, finally, 150 years after the First Amendment was passed, we have the federal courts, the most important federal court, the Supreme Court, giving it some teeth, giving it some real meaning, and telling the nation that uh, Congress and the states cannot criminalize speech that, is, um, that happens to criticize the government. You just can't do it. And since that time, since the 1950s and a case called Brandenburg v. Hayes, the uh, United States Supreme Court has been pretty darn good, not perfect, but pretty, pretty darn good in, in giving real meaning to the words that, uh, that Dennis uh, recited, those words that Congress shall make no law. So that brings us up to the 50s and the 60s. I want to mention two cases in particular that uh, came out of the uh, mid-60s in, in 1971. They're both important. One of them is the subject of a uh, Steven Spielberg movie. Okay? The first is a very famous case called New York Times versus Sullivan. In the 1950s and 60s, what our president would call the lamestream media, that would be stuff like the New York Times, right? Uh, would write stories about the civil rights movement in the South. And it would write stories about how uh, Southern states uh, and local government officials, police, and so on and so forth, uh, what, what were they doing to uh, repress the civil rights movement in the South? And there was an article that was published in the New York Times in 1960. And it was intended to raise funds for the defense of Dr. Martin Luther King, who had been charged with perjury, I think, in uh, Alabama. And in the course of this article, uh, of this advertisement, really, it was advertisement, um, the authors of the advertisement talked about how there had been uh, an oppression of student rallies at, uh, in Montgomery, and a number of people were arrested, and so on and so forth. And the police chief, I think it was, down in um, Alabama, who was not mentioned by name at all, filed a defamation lawsuit against the New York Times. And he said, it's pretty clear to anybody, anybody reading this, this advertisement could figure out you're talking about me that I was the guy who falsely arrested folks, and I was the guy who engaged in, in the uh, you know, oppression of the civil rights movement. And an Alabama jury agreed with him, 
and there was a $500,000 fine, damages, against the New York Times. At that time, at around that time, there were over $300 million in damages that juries had levied against newspapers for writing in a negative way from the South's perspective about South, Southern efforts to oppress and repress the civil rights movement. This was a tactic that the South used to shut down the press. You'd file a defamation action in a friendly court with friendly jurors, good old boys, down and, you know, from wherever, and they would return a, you know, a, a, a verdict against the press, and the goal would be to force the newspaper to go into bankruptcy or stop writing articles about this touchy subject at all. So there was a concerted effort to use defamation law as a way to shut the press up because the South didn't like what it was saying about the way uh, the South was handling the civil rights movement. So this $500,000 verdict goes up to the United States Supreme Court. And in a very important decision, the court says basically this. This advertisement was really nothing more than a criticism of public officials. That's the very kind of thing that the First <laughs> Amendment is supposed to protect. Criticism of public officials, how they run their government, how they deal with protests, and so on and so forth. How do we protect the right of the press, or the press as representatives of the public, to criticize uh, their government officials? The way we do it is by providing, the magic words are called breathing space. Supreme Court said the First Amendment provides breathing space to the newspapers. Now, what did it mean? To err is human. Newspapers are run by humans. Newspapers are going to occasionally err. It is inevitable in public discourse that newspapers will occasionally make mistakes in their articles and their advertisements. If we hold them liable any time they make a mistake, they're toast, right? I mean, they will just be subject to one you know, verdict after another. So the Supreme Court said it is not enough under the First Amendment to prove that a newspaper simply made a mistake. You have to prove that the newspaper said something false and defamatory on purpose. You have to prove what's called actual malice. That's the famous language phrase from the case. Actual malice means that the newspaper actually knew, the author and the editors actually knew that what they were saying in the, in the article was false and they printed it anyway. Or there's a slightly lesser version that they acted with reckless disregard for the probable falsity. All right? So if 20 people are telling you one version of, the, of what the truth and one other person is telling you the opposite, and you go with the one person, okay, maybe you're showing reckless disregard for the probable falsity of the truth. The idea, by adopting this, this test, was to give breathing space to the press. And it made it very difficult for public officials, who are the subject of criticism, to get verdicts, defamation, libel, slander verdicts, against the press. So New York Times uh, versus Sullivan is considered one of the most important First Amendment cases uh, in the history of our jurisprudence. And the second case, and this will take me one minute, is the one you might have seen in the recent movie called The Post. And it's about something called a prior restraint. Can the government prevent a newspaper from publishing something in the first instance? There are some circumstances where you can if they publish something knowingly falsely, you can punish them after the fact for money damages. But can you ever prevent a newspaper from publishing something in the first instance? Can you get an injunction against them? That was the issue in the case called the Pentagon Papers, which is the subject of this recent Steven Spielberg movie. Right? The Pentagon, Robert McNamara, had commissioned a study of America's involvement in the Vietnam War, starting, I think, with Truman, at least, and going up through uh, the Johnson administration.
administration. And what that report, which was top secret, said is that every single president, starting from Truman, going up through Lyndon Baines Johnson, had lied to the American people about why we were in, the, uh, why we were in uh, uh, Vietnam and what our chances of success were. Basically, the report showed we knew from the get-go that we could never win the war. And yet, president after president sent American boys over to die because they thought that if they were the president who gave up, who quit, and let the dominoes fall, that they would uh, suffer some electoral defeat. So those papers were leaked by a guy named Daniel Ellsberg to the New York Times and then to the Post. The New York Times started publishing them, and the, uh, the Nixon administration ran to court and got an injunction from a trial judge, from a federal district court, telling the New York Times, you cannot publish that. These are top secret papers. You are damaging the... Uh, the integrity of the White House, you're damaging our foreign policy. How will people, uh, foreign governments, ever be able to trust us when these kinds of uh, secret papers are released? And the case rapidly went up to the Supreme Court. While it was going to the Supreme Court, um, uh, Meryl Streep decided to show <laughs> some backbone. She came into her own as Catherine Graham, head of the Wall Street, uh, excuse me, of the Washington Post. And the Post published the papers. And then the United States Supreme Court issued another incredibly important decision. It said that uh, if the First Amendment means anything, it means that the government cannot tell the public or the press what to print. We cannot prevent you from speaking in the first instance. You just can't. Now, maybe there's a tiny little, tiny little loophole in there. For example, if the New York Times had gotten hold of the <laughs> invasion plans for D-Day and wanted to publish them in uh, late May of 1945, four, excuse me, 44, could the government prevent that from happening? That's an interesting question. But absent something like troop movements or invasion plans, the First Amendment means that you cannot punish, uh, prevent a member of the public or the press from speaking in the first instance. So we've come a long, long way from <laughs> the uh, ambitions and ideals behind the First Amendment to get to the point where it actually has some serious teeth and is um, a bulwark against a government that, if it had its druthers, uh, would shut the media down. I mean, that's why we hear our, the President Trump tweeting constantly and making outrageous statements like we should reform our nation's libel laws. He doesn't like being criticized. And he's not alone. He's just another example of many leaders around the world who don't like being criticized. And if their uh, power isn't checked, <clears throat> they will shut all of us down and prevent us from criticizing them prevent us from uh, seeking to uh, uh, get others to share our views and affect change in our government. And I think what we're seeing now <clears throat> is we've gone through that. We've got the Supreme Court there. I was, it was in Washington working, not at the Washington Post, but the old Washington Star. And um, not for the Pentagon Papers. We came in a few months after that was done, but all through the Watergate period and the tail end of the Vietnam situation and the movie is good or the memory is, is 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 good or the conversations about times like that are good but the reality of it was so intense of what was going on between the government and the press what's going on now is is is, is rough but this was nixon and company because johnson never did anything like this and he got pilloried and he lost his job um, he never attacked the press. He attacked the press like we all attack you know, people who don't like, but he didn't move his government into it. He didn't try to put the muscle on him the way that uh, the Nixon administration did and continued to do right until its, its very end. Um, it was a, a season of such tension and such anger and such rage back and forth that, as Dan says, that lacking the, this 
simple little statement, Congress shall make no laws, that, that at that moment, history could have been changed, but for the law. The law was there, the uh, Constitution was there, the courts were there, by and large, they don't always go perfectly, nothing does, but the, the idea that somehow everything is, is easy and resolved once everybody shakes hands on it, you know, isn't what happens. And so the constant need for vigilance, the constant need for journalists and the citizenry to appreciate the liberties that people have gone to a lot of trouble to get for them is um, just as alive now as it was in the 50s or the, or the um, alien sedition years or whatever. And in today's time, and there's so much complexity to this that uh, we could do five of these on, uh, um, on what it means when a student says something and the teachers don't like it. Is that First Amendment? We think it is. Some people say it isn't. Uh, whether you have a right to, you know, the, the famous sayings are freedom of speech, can't yell fire in a theater because people will trample each other, or my right to flail my arms out stops at Dan's nose. I can't say, well, I, 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 I can hit you because I have the right to swing my arms around. His post is that I have a right to have a whole nose and you can't do that. The, uh, this is all kind of nice academic uh, angels on pinheads uh, talk, but the reality now I submit to you, as a guy who's been around for a while, I was in a newsroom when, uh, as a kid, but uh, I was in the Boston Globe newsroom when Sullivan came out in 1964. And I don't think I appreciated it then, I was just in my early 20s, uh, cub reporter, and, but in my, I'm trying to say, in my lifetime, I have seen this kind of a change. I have seen the change where the, where the government has been put in its place to allow a bunch of roughnecks like exist on Broad Street or all the 100,000 other newspapers and things to do the job that we feel we have to do, not out of arrogance, saying, you know, everybody wants to, you know, give the moon to, to, um, to uh, Cotton Mather or, or to Richard Nixon, but because this is important. What we do is important, and it's not important to us. I mean, we never made any money at it. It's, you know, it's one of the worst paying industries on earth, uh, I can attest to. Uh, but we did important stuff because we were allowed to do it. England, this wonderful, oh, yeah, let's go see the, watch Queen Victoria, let's watch all these wonderful shows about the, you know, how elegant, and you can't get away with anything in England. They'll sue you and they'll put you right out of business. They have laws that go back to, to before the French Revolution over there. It's, uh, you know, France doesn't have it, nobody has it, but we do have it. And it's under attack, it's under assault all the time. And the media, which is changing, which I'd like to get into, and we're going to turn this over to questions here, uh, the media has changed so much, just as it was the media and the press of the First Amendment's uh, description was a bunch of little raggedy uh, newspapers or pamphleteers. It then went to, suddenly as the cities grew and the, and the need for more information or the, the marketability of Newspapers uh, suddenly took off over the next century and a half, turned into these gigantic newspapers such as the Times and the Post, or these powerful, wonderful newspapers like the Current or Providence or Globe and other, other communities. And so we had muscle. We had the New York Times, which would go to court in a flash. They weren't going to bend, bend an edge. God love them for doing that. Current did it. Uh, uh, Curran actually got sued by Thomas Jefferson right after he makes his statements about how uh, uh, he'd rather have a government without, for, without newspapers and newspapers or whatever, whatever that was. He immediately sued the Hartford Current for label, libeling him, but uh, we won that. But uh, uh, now the, the world's changing. We still have a Times, we still have a Post, but the Current is diminished. Uh, Des Moines is diminished. Providence is, is almost vanished. Uh, Things are changing in the traditional media that you would expect to be fighting your battles for you. And, um, and what we've got is kind of a marketplace of the press that is closer, I think, to the, to the times of, of the uh, First Amendment, where pamphleteers, call them bloggers, call them uh, uh, web page people, exist to say whatever they want. And that's wonderful. Used to be, I, it took me years to get to be a columnist in newspapers. But I had to uh, work my way up. I had to be a cub reporter. I had to get some diversions to go to war and come back and do all these other things. But it took me years. I went to big newspapers and finally um, 
tricked my way into writing a column in Washington, took, uh, got some uh, embarrassing photographs of the editors here, and got a column. In, in, but, but it took years to get to that point. And I was allowed to do this by the management of the company. Thank you very much. Uh, now, anybody in this room, and maybe most of you people probably do, can set up a blog. I mean, I guess I don't blog so much anymore, but can, can make commentary that, would, that was mechanically and, uh, and you know, in terms of technology, impossible 20 years ago. Now you, everybody can do it. I did a column, column for the current for over 20 years, almost 25 years. And they took it away from me. Okay, that's fair enough. But I, don't, I didn't think it was fair enough, but, uh, but they did. <laughs> so uh, there was politics behind that, it always is. But, uh, no. So this was in the early 2000s. And so I got another assignment, which I bumbled around at for a while before I ran for my life. And, but I decided to set up a blog. And this the internet thing seems like it's fun. And the Hartford Current came on me like the hammers of hell. All of a sudden, I was being hauled into this thing. I had to get a lawyer. We fought this thing. It, uh, they said I had no right to do a blog. I said, I'm sitting in my, my uh, family room at home writing things about the Red Sox or how my wife makes me sit and watch the credits at the end of movies for an hour until I've forgotten, <laughs> forgotten what the movie was all about. And, uh, you know, stuff like that because I just wanted to say things that were on my mind. And, and the Hartford Current tried to stop me. I said, what, what, what's this all about? And I, I won that with the lawyers. Uh, gets in far more details, but Connecticut actually has a law that's very favorable to me and you if you do this on your work, out of the workplace. But the point is, I could sit, as you can, at home and write up anything that you want. Consequences if you do something stupid or if you... Uh, you know, insult the neighbor, you know, who's not a government official, and you're going to have to pay for it. But they, nobody can stop you from doing it, but there are consequences if you do it wrong. Uh, but, so now we're back almost to the pamphleteer days, which is wonderful, because it took me years to do it. Now anybody can do it, and, and sad to say, people with no experience or no knowledge or training or editing uh, do do it. But what I think the peril to and we always talk in peril, we got newspaper people tend to be very operatic, uh, seeing peril everywhere, but uh, usually we're right, is the peril now, which I think is so extreme with the uh, Trump administration, is not that they're taking steps yet to uh, go to court against the press or the media, not that they're um, challenging or getting uh, fake people to challenge your business uh, licenses as the Nixon people did, or like having enemies lists, that he does have an enemies list. But what they're doing is they're poisoning the well about the public's right to free and unfettered information so dramatically that the term like fake news and the cynicism against the media has become axiomatic, it's knee-jerk. People, yeah, that's right, that's right. So there's a whole set of uh, the country that is being told this over and over and over again, whereas Nixon did a little of that with the, the Spiro Agnew and his nattering nabobs and all those kind of cute lines like that, but there was never anything so sustained as what's being directed at your media right now. We can take it. We've been taking it since Cotton Mather. We've been taking it since Alien and Sedition. We can take this. We go through it and we know that this will be over. We know that in three or four years, maybe another bunch of years, this will change. We'll go back. Somebody in, in his right mind will come, you know, from our point of view, will come back <laughs> into, into power and, and reverse all these things. In the interim, what's going to be lost? Um, this, to me, to undermine not just the institutions, but the whole sense that it's based on is that you guys can feel comfortable that to the best of our abilities and skills, we're giving you something that we believe to be true. But if you automatically are being conditioned to say, it's fake, these guys are lying, because they don't, because the person who's uh, being criticized doesn't like the criticism. People have always been criticism. Roosevelt was criticized in ways that would take the breath out of you. But he brushed it off and he moved forward. The press has been criticized forever, but we will brush it off. But now, this stuff is taking root, that there are whole um, pockets and, um, loci of, of real, intense, anti-media things that 
frankly, you're not really affecting us as much as it's affecting the readers, where people will be chilled off from writing things because they don't want to get, I want to hear a story about, well, the president did this, or the mayor or the governor uh, did this. And then there's 5,000 uh, comments at the end of it full of rage and hate and, and, and violence and all this kind of thing, uh, spiritual violence, uh, tagged on at the end. So people say, after a while, man, I don't, I don't put my foot in that water. That's this, this piranha in there. And so this, this is something that, it's, these, these are hard times. Uh, uh, the big institutions are drying up. Uh, there's, there's no money, the Hartford Current, uh, paper I love and, and de devoted uh, the majority of my career to, has, has, has shrunken to a, a shadow of itself. It's uh, sad to say, not alone. This is happening everywhere, where the circulation is half of what it was. The workforce is 20% of what it was. Uh, at its peak, from 400 in the newsroom down to less than 100. Uh, that's just the reality of the world. That's not because they're stupid. I think it's just the world changed. And people are now reading things on the web or they're you know, like that, which is very, you know, a lot of risks to that. But those are risks that you take. But if the system, if the authority figures can go from talking about the debauching the manners of, of uh, New England to creating a, an audience that doesn't believe anything you say, then we're all in trouble. And we're in deep trouble because then they can do anything they want because anybody who raises up his hand is going to be intimidated. So I'll close by following on Dennis's point about some current threats, if you will, to, to the First Amendment and values of free speech. Dennis has talked about some economic threats that have uh, diminished the, the press just because of the changes in the world and the development of the internet. Um, the concern I have, and the concern that Connecticut Foundation for Open Government has, which is one of the reasons we have this program today, is that um, the generation that's coming of age, high school students, college students, <clears throat> are not being taught about the importance of the First Amendment the value, the reasons why it exists, and why it is so essential to uh, a functioning democracy. And if you don't understand why the First Amendment is important, why the government needs to protect free speech, then as you grow up and come into power and become judges, and, uh, legislators, and whatnot, um, I fear that uh, the strength, those teeth, that the Supreme Court has put in the <clears throat> First Amendment over the years may fall out. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us uh, to make sure that the younger generation, and I hate saying that because I feel like an old man, and I'm not, right? Uh, we need to convey to them the importance of the First Amendment. And one of the important messages, and it's a painful one, is why should the First Amendment protect hate speech? This is a major issue on college campuses these days, where you have speech codes <laughs> and protests. Tonight at the University of Connecticut, up at stores, there'll be a conservative speaker named Ben Shapiro who's coming, and, and we already know that some kind of ruckus will develop. I don't, God forbid, any violence, but we saw what happened the last time. We have to figure out a way to be civil when we hear the opinions, even vile opinions, of, uh, of other people. Um, there's a reason that even hate speech is protected under the First Amendment. There's a reason that Nazis were allowed to march or had the right to march through Skokie, Illinois. The reason is that if you give the government the power to decide what is hate speech and what isn't. The inevitable result is that the people who are in power will decide that any criticism of their class, their ilk, is hate speech. Imagine, and I, imagine a right-wing, white supremacist, alt-right government in the United States that suddenly decides that the Black Lives Movement is propagating hate speech against whites, and it passes laws <clears throat> banning hate speech against whites, essentially criminalizing 
the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, that's absurd. Can you imagine that happening? But if hate speech is not protected under the First Amendment, the scenario I described is not so outrageous. We tolerate hate speech. We protect it because it's always possible when the tables turn and a different set of group of people are in power um, that they start labeling our speech, what we would never think of as hate speech, as hate speech. So how do we respond to it? I think the best way to respond to speech we disagree with is by counter speech, <clears throat> not violently trying to suppress the speaker we don't like, not trying to prevent them from coming to a college campus or to a forum like this. We write and disagree with them. We write op-eds. We form marches. We have protests outside. We carry placards. We take advantage of our Twitter feeds and our blogs and our Facebook posts to explain the factual errors that are being propagated by people who uh, utter messages that we disagree with. That's the way to deal with disagreeable speech and hate speech, not shutting it down. Do you guys have questions or, or disagree? Think or, or, or anything? Any issues that you're seeing? We, yeah. Wait till the uh, mic comes. comes. Here comes, comes your mic. Uh, other than the fact that the, the freedom of press clause, clause of the First Amendment specifies the press, is there any distinction between freedom of speech and freedom of this press under the First Amendment? Dennis pretty much answered that question earlier. I, the, the legal answer to that question is, is there's, the Supreme Court has basically relied entirely on the free speech clause to protect the press. So th there, is, there is no real distinction <clears throat> between the rights uh, under the First Amendment vis-a-vis -vis free speech and the free press clause. The free press clause has come all, become almost vestigial like a little appendix that just hangs there and isn't uh, focused on much. The free speech clause does the work. I'm not some little <laughs> appendix that just hangs there. Well, maybe I am. I don't know. Yeah. What do you see uh, as the state of the last part of the First Amendment on freedom of assembly? I mean, where does that stand in current law right now? And do you think the First Amendment is an adequate protection for freedom of assembly? Think I'm, of the Charlottesville uh, you know, yeah, event a few yeah. months ago. I, I think it is because because it does happen that you can have a Charlottesville with these these uh, people with with views and, and behavior that we don't like uh, get that most of us don't like um, don't consider to be nice people to uh, um, do assemble and. That, that would be a pretty good test of it, if you could do that, where the Nazis could come in. I don't like this neo's business. These are Nazis who come in and uh, um, demonstrate and, and do all this thing without anybody stopping them. Uh, the Black Lives people do theirs. The women people do theirs. The, I, I, it seems not to have been tested in a way that would be really negative. I think that's, that's a good cover for them to, uh, to do that, just in the doing of it. Now, if there's some footnote that, that I don't know. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and uh, uh, you know, Dan can, can speak to that, but it certainly seems like there are plenty of assemblies going on. In fact, there should be more, and uh, it would be nice if you know, there was, if we can romanticize the 70s and things like that when the college kids turned out and, and, and all that and wish for that, but uh, it was good that it was going on. But these people came out and, and expressed their point of view. Now college kids are sound asleep. I don't know what they're doing. Um, uh, I wish there were more, but I don't think anybody's stopping them from doing it. I don't think. It, but is there any, any legal I side? Think, well, there, there are robust protections in the law, so in the Supreme Court law, for, for freedom of assembly, to protect the people, the right of the people to peaceably assemble. So if they want to hold protests outside the White House, outside the Capitol, um, uh, those are considered public forums, and there's very robust protection. The problems that I think we're beginning to see um, are, are practical problems. Charlottesville is an example of that. What happens when you get a group of alt-right, 
you know, tiki torch carrying uh, neo-Nazi type white supremacists whose, whose real goal when they come to Charlottesville isn't to convey a particular message, but to spark a fight, right? How do the police deal with groups that gather um, not because they want to give a speech, but because they are deliberately there to provoke usually some kind of violent reaction from a more progressive or left-wing group. And so the struggle for the law enforcement is to figure out a way to allow the group whose message you don't like to speak because they have a constitutional right to do that. Um, allow the competing group that wants to form a counter-protest to do so, yet maintain the safety of both groups, physical safety of both groups, and members of the public who come to watch. Uh, some, uh, there was an effort in Boston a, a number of months ago to create a kind of uh, no man's zone between the groups, and even the press was not allowed into that zone, which made it difficult for the press to cover the speakers you know, when they were up on a podium. Uh, I don't see that as a threat to this basic right of assembly. I do see it as a practical problem that uh, local law enforcement and school, you know, university security folks are, are going to have to deal with. And I suspect they'll struggle with it for a while. It'll never be perfect. But the basic right to speak uh, and assemble will be protected. Anybody here? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sue. Yeah. Um, uh, Dennis mentioned his case with the current. What what resources are available to people who don't have the deep pockets of a company or a corporation who is suing them when the smaller individual is in the right? What can they do? What can the Davids do against the Goliaths? Well, if we're talking about a case where the Goliath is the government, so a classic First Amendment case where it's some branch of the government is trying to shut a speaker down, or are we talking about a case where, as Dennis said, some private company uh, or private entity is, is suing? Any, any case where, where the, the larger entity has much deeper pockets and just can keep harassing a smaller entity from doing what they want to do. Well, I've got my ACLU number on speed dial for that reason. I mean, I get many calls for people who are looking for help, and, and I, I can't, you know, sometimes I'm precluded from helping out in the, person, the, the David you know, in that situation. There are organizations uh, like mine, CFOG, Connecticut Foundation for Open Government, Connecticut Council on Freedom of Information, I said the ACLU. There are law schools that have clinics. Uh, there, uh, that's true. Um, uh, there is legislation uh, in a number of states, and we're working on Connecticut, called anti-slap legislation, which is, uh, gives a statutory right to the David to sue the Goliath. Um, if the Goliath is attempting to use the legal system to shut David up, right? Uh, it's, it's not a perfect world. Um, our justice system is expensive, and finding somebody to represent the David is, uh, it's not always possible. Um, so uh, I wish I had a, a better answer. But there are some organizations uh, that put together networks of attorneys, uh, like myself and other colleagues, to help people out in the very situation you've just described. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That was really interesting and informative, and I'm sure it gave everybody a lot to think about, and we really appreciate that. I'd like to ask our audience to please fill out the evaluation that we have for you, and also to share any ideas for other programs that you'd like to see. If you'd like to explore other aspects of our Constitution, our civic life, please jot that down. Um, we really would appreciate that. Many of our topics that we have during programs come from suggestions from people that we know. So we appreciate it. And we appreciate you coming today and sharing your thoughts and your information with us. It was really fascinating. And I'd like everybody to join me in thanking Dan and Dennis. Mm -hmm. And Sue Thank you. Thank you.